Animals have senses. They hear, they see, they smell, touch, and taste. And so they can react to their environment. Green plants have none of these senses, yet they react to their environment too. The leaves of the mallow weed follow the sun from sunrise to sunset. The leaves on this ivy vine have arranged themselves to catch as much sunlight as possible. In fact, most green plants turn toward the light, but if they don't have senses, animals, how do they do it? Charles Darwin, the English scientist, tried to find an answer to that question in the 1870s. The way he searched for an answer, and how other men after him continued the search, gives us an insight into how scientists go about solving problems. Using simple equipment, Darwin began by setting up experiments in which he could control the amount and direction of light falling on plants. He used grass seedlings that had been grown in the dark so they'd be straight, and exposed them to a dim light from one side only. Time-lapse photography shows what Darwin observed during the following eight hours. The seedlings bent toward the light. In a later series of experiments, Darwin covered straight seedlings and exposed them to the light coming only through a tiny hole. This way, most of the light fell on the tips of the plants. The seedlings bent toward the light as before. So Darwin began to think that only the light hitting the tips of plants caused them to bend. He devised an experiment to test this idea and repeated it many times to be sure of the result. The tips of seedlings were covered with light-proof foil caps. They were placed in daylight along with a group of uncovered seedlings. The result was what Darwin expected. The seedlings with foil caps remained straight, but the uncovered seedlings bent toward the light. This proved that bending was caused only by the light that hit the tip of the plant. In 1881, after many other experiments, Darwin summed up his findings in this book. He concluded that there must be some substance in the tips of plants that reacts to light and causes the plants to bend. What was this substance, and how did it cause bending? Darwin didn't answer these questions. He left it to other scientists to find out, and several tried but failed. Then the Danish botanist Peter Boysen Jensen took up the problem in 1910. Building upon the experiments of Darwin and others, he continued the search for the unknown substance. He cut off the tips of seedlings, so no bending could take place. He placed a thin layer of gelatin on each stump. Then he replaced the tips on top of the gelatin. The seedlings were exposed to light from one side only. After several hours, the seedlings had bent toward the light in a normal way. So Darwin was right. There was a substance produced in the tip, and it had to be a chemical that could pass downward through the gelatin and cause the plant to bend. Next, Boyce and Jensen inserted thin mica plates in some seedlings. 
some on one side, some on the other. These little plates would block the flow of chemical in only one side of a plant. Then he exposed them to light from one side. This is what he saw. Only one set of seedlings bent. Those in which the chemical flowed down through the shaded side. This suggested that the chemical made that side grow faster and caused the plant to bend. The Hungarian botanist Arpad Paul tested this idea in 1918. He cut off the tips of seedlings as had been done before. Then he replaced them in off-center positions. Now the chemical from the tip would flow down through only one side of the plant. And instead of exposing the seedlings to light, Paul grew them in the dark. All the seedlings bent, even without light. And they bent away from the side that received the chemical from the tip. This is the path down which the chemical flowed. So clearly bending took place because the chemical speeded up growth on this side of the plant. In 1928, the Dutch botanist Fritz Wendt took up the work that had begun 50 years earlier with Darwin. Working under an orange light that would not affect plants, he cut off the tips of seedlings. He placed them on a block of agar and left them there long enough for the growth chemical from the tips to be absorbed by the agar. After two hours, the agar had absorbed most of the growth chemical from the tips. More chemical was absorbed where the tips rested on the agar, less in the center of the block, and least of all, near the bottom. Now Wendt cut the blocks into small cubes being careful to keep each one in its original position. The cubes containing the growth chemical were placed on the sides of seedlings. Each row of cubes on a different set of seedlings. The bottom row of seedlings received the agar containing the least amount of chemical, the top row the most. Here is the result. The amount of bending closely matched the amount of chemical in the cubes. Hardly any chemical in the lower row of cubes, therefore little or no bending. More chemical in the middle row, more bending. Most of the chemical was contained in the top row of cubes, and these seedlings bent the most. So the larger the amount of growth chemical, the greater the bending. Now Darwin's original question of why plants bend toward the light was answered. A growth chemical produced in the tip moves down through the shaded side of a plant. This chemical causes the shaded side to grow faster and this extra growth bends the plant toward the light. Further research revealed the identity of the mysterious chemical. It was a plant hormone, and years later, ways were found to extract it from plants. More research led to the discovery of many different kinds of plant hormones, each with a different effect on the growth of plants. This led, in turn, to large-scale manufacturing of man-made hormones with a variety of uses. A spray that will kill broad-leafed weeds without affecting the slender shoots of barley. A chemical that makes trees hold their fruit longer so that ripe fruit will stay on the tree until it can be picked. 
a substance applied to tomato blossoms, so they will produce tomatoes out of season. A chemical sprayed on chrysanthemum plants that slows down their growth. So the flowers, like those on the right, grow into a short, tight cluster. And another chemical applied to corn seedlings that has just the opposite effect. It makes them grow taller. None of these things would be possible were it not for men who became curious about why plants bend toward the light. But many questions about chemical reactions in plants remain to be answered. No one has yet fully explained what chemical causes plants to do this. Some plants react to touch, but no one knows what chemical is involved in the reaction. Other plants react in even stranger ways. No one knows what new discoveries will be made or what new questions will arise as such puzzles of the plant world are solved one by one.